thousand new cases of COVID-19 in Ontario. But the latest modeling projections in the province are actually making predictions that it could get even worse. Projections show if people do not reduce their contact with others, the number of cases could soon overwhelm hospitals. Now, at this point, officials say COVID-19 patients occupy more than 400 ICU beds in Ontario. And projections show there could be about 500 patients in intensive care by mid-January and potentially more than 1,000 by February. Dr. Adelstein Brown is co-chair of the Ontario COVID-19 Science Advisory Table, and he talked about what these numbers could mean for hospitals in the province. We're at a dangerous point. We will have to confront choices that no doctor ever wants to make and no family ever wants to hear. There will be choices about who will get the care they need and who will not. Well, let's continue the discussion right now and bring into the conversation right now Dr. Eli Malice. He is an ICU doctor at Windsor Regional Hospital and a regional critical care lead. He joins us right now in Windsor, Ontario. Dr. Malice, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Listen, I, I, I want to begin here with what you just heard there from Dr. Brown, uh, that soon doctors will be forced to decide who should get treatment, who should not, essentially who, who, who would live and who would die. As one who is dedicated to saving life, what does that do to you hearing that? I think it's important to differentiate the fact that for, for ICU physicians, we do make life and death decisions every day. Um, and there are a certain number of patients um, that, that don't benefit from critical care, um, regardless of the pandemic or not. Um, if, I mean, he is correct uh, to a degree, if the numbers keep going unabated at some point, um, we might find ourselves in a situation where we don't have enough beds, um, ICU beds for all the patients. And, and in that scenario, um, we have guidelines to help direct the physicians to make the choices to save the most number of people. Um, but it's a, certainly it's a scary thing. It's not a situation that any physician wants to find themselves in. I do think, though, in ICU as a group, we're very used to making those very tough decisions. Mm -hmm. So talk to us then about the reality you're currently facing, because the, we know that there are challenges to the system at this moment in time, in particular with certain hospitals, certainly uh, in your region, uh, as one pointed to in, in the province. And this is before the surge that the latest modeling numbers suggest is coming. So how are things right now on the ground? How would you typify your average day right now in the hospital? It's busy. <laughs> Um, right now, our ICUs in my region, that's um, including Sarnia, Chatham, Windsor, and Leamington, are operating um, between 90 and 100 percent capacity. So, you know, every few days we have to look, I have to look at balancing the load, the critical care load for the region to make sure, you know, my concern is that I don't see ICU beds as Windsor's ICU beds. I, I see them as regional, as provincial beds. So what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do, and what the command table for the province tries to do is to balance the load because we have areas in the province that have different amounts of COVID and as a consequence have different needs for critical care. So what's unusual for us is one, we're running at 90 to 100% or more all the time, which creates a tremendous strain on the doctors and the nurses, physiotherapy. I mean, everybody that works in the ICU is you know, running at 130% or more. It's very difficult. Um, but we're transferring patients between hospitals to make sure that everybody has access. And that's certainly one of the most challenging things. Well, talk to us about that, because I do wonder how patients react when they hear that they're being transferred to another uh, hospital for care, because uh, with many cases, the transfers to another hospital in another city, further away from family and friends. So what's the reaction that you're tracking and seeing right now? Yeah, I, it's difficult. You know, right now, I think it's most important to understand it's difficult even if you're in the your own local ICU because we have there's really no visitors you know so you've got patients that are critically ill um, without their family near them and the family can't speak to them or maybe they can FaceTime them but they can't be there and I mean that's already a tremendous strain and a tremendous deviation from normal um, you know we like to engage our families heavily in critical care we like we like them at the bedside we like them to be part of our rounds um, you know, often they're the substitute decision makers for the patients, and so that's incredibly important. So already there's this, this level of, of uh, distance that exists, um, even if you're local. Um, I'm not sure you feel that as much now because there is no visitation when a patient goes to 
um, an ICU may be 30 or 40 minutes away, it, it's absolutely harder. I, I would never deny that. But because all the communication right now really is, by and large, electronic, yeah, I, I don't want to say it's a good thing, but perhaps the difficulty isn't as bad as it might normally be. The real challenge is that you know, we've separated patients and their families, um, and we do it to protect you know, everybody. We do it to protect the families, we do it to protect the patients and the workers, but that doesn't mean it's not terribly difficult um, and traumatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's the reality people are facing right now. They, they've been facing since the spring. Uh, as you know, Ontario is right now at a stay-at-home order. Uh, but add to that the revelation this week that, that roughly 70% of people in the Windsor-Essex area, where you are, essentially ignored pleas to limit contacts and visit uh, visits outside of their home over the holidays. What is your message to people right now in your area, given that high percentage that perhaps didn't wake up to how serious the situation it was over the holidays? I think the first thing is, I don't think anybody is in a position to point fingers or blame. Um, it's a very complicated thing to try to figure out why we're spiking now and why, you know, I think obviously, um, you know, more family gatherings may be part of it, of course. Um, I think it's, I think if people could see what's going on in the hospitals, it would make it much easier for um, those uh, family members and, you know, the people in the general community to follow some of the guidelines that are being put out. I'm not a public health physician. I'm not a politician, um, thank goodness. But I think given what's going on, given how our resources are so strained and stressed to breaking, and the spike just seems to keep going, um, we do need everybody to do every little bit they can to prevent this from getting worse. It has such broad ranging implications. Um, I, that doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean, I mean, I have three children that are, are, that are not in school now, and it, I, I think it's incredibly hard for kids, um, for, for people that are out of work. I can't even imagine. I think I'm very fortunate to have a job. But given what's going on in the hospitals right now, um, and the fact that if this continues, we will run out of beds at some point. This can't keep going, you know, forever. We need everybody to do every little bit they can. And if that means staying home, and if that means distancing yourself from family and friends, um, you know, mask wearing where you might not, not normally think of doing it, you need to do it, um, or at least try your very best. You know, it's interesting, as you and I are talking here, you, you reference beds. And of course, there's a lot of talk right now about systems getting overwhelmed, but you know, that system does include healthcare workers like yourself. How are you and your colleagues doing right now? How are you holding up? Are you holding up? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard. Um, it takes a toll on the nurses in critical care. It takes a toll on the doctors, the physiotherapists. I think a lot of people don't realize how many um, workers actually go into, um, you know, taking care of one patient in the ICU, pharmacists, uh, respiratory therapists. I mean, the list goes on. And every one of those workers is being asked to go above and beyond. Um, you know, usually, uh, when you start work in the morning and, you know, 12 hours later, more often than not, you know, you haven't had any, uh, you haven't had a break, you haven't had anything to eat. It's very common for me to come home and have my first meal of the day uh, in the evening. Um, and, you know, that's okay, because that's what we need to do to help patients right now. I think I recognize, we all recognize this is temporary, um, but there's no question when this, you know, it is, a, there is a strain, there will be some burnout, of course, but I also have to commend all the healthcare workers on how they responded to this. The nurses, the doctors, everybody is really, they're putting their head down and they're all rowing in the same direction to get it done. Um, there really isn't another way to do it, uh, but it is taking a tremendous strain. Again, um, you don't see your families. You, you're, I'm terrified of giving COVID to my family. Um, I know lots of uh, doctors and nurses that stopped living um, with their families. Uh, they go into a hotel or you know some kind of uh, alternate living situation just so they decrease the chance of giving covid um to their loved ones and that just goes to show you how serious we think this is you know i mean i I've, I've seen it kill i've seen it kill um patients in their 20s 30s and 40s it's not it's not just the elderly dr eli malice thank you for this uh things to consider on this weekend appreciate the time thank you very much